Hi, and welcome to another episode of Reimagined Energy. Today's guest is Valerie Bennett, a professional engineer with 15 years experience with climate action, energy regulation, and energy efficiency in the areas of Canada, Asia, and Europe. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, Valerie. Hey, good morning, Maria. Good morning. Thanks for joining me today. Well, you've got a lot of awesome background information and your career is doing really well. Just tell tell me a little bit of how you got to this point. Sure. That sounds great. Uh, so I have been working in energy efficiency for about 15 years. I have a background in uh, mechanical engineering. And uh, out of school, I spent the first six years after my master's program working in consulting. So the first place I worked in consulting was actually a small consulting firm in Florence, Italy, where I uh, worked on different projects for the European mm-hmm. Union as well as for the World Bank. Cool. And <laughs> thank you. And uh, then I uh, moved over to a small company called Marbeck, which was then bought by ICF, which is a larger consulting firm, and with them uh, worked across Canada and also uh, in Beijing and Singapore. Uh, upon returning from from Asia, I worked briefly at a utility company uh, in, in Toronto and then um, moved on to their energy regulator. So the Ontario Energy Board, which regulates the price of electricity and natural gas in Ontario. And I joined as a senior advisor there and I uh, for and I was there um, working on different uh, energy efficiency and climate related projects for five years. And I became the manager uh, and was a manager there for three years. And I joined the Office of Energy Efficiency within Natural Resources Canada in late 2022. Awesome. So that's where I am now. That is awesome. So <laughs> let's 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 ask some d- really good questions here. So the first one is why is energy efficiency relevant to the energy transition? Okay. Yeah, happy to speak to that. I also just wanted to note that I won't be speaking uh, so my opinions won't reflect necessarily those of my uh, either my present or my current employers. Uh, sorry, my former employers. Uh, but um, yeah, really happy to speak to that. You're speaking uh, as more it, on your personal experience, ex- for sure. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, I think energy efficiency is pretty exciting. Uh, when I say energy efficiency, it's all about using uh, energy more efficiently. So efficiently. So either um, avoiding using it when you don't need it, or using devices that are more are more efficient. And uh, there's kind of two big pieces there. So one is, uh, in, or two big ways that that uh, helps with the energy transition and reducing emissions. Uh, first off, if you reduce energy use, you tend to reduce emissions. Uh, that's because um, a lot of our electricity systems continue to use fossil fuels for different parts of generation. Um, and we still use fossil fuels uh, for a lot of heating and different purposes. So if you use less electricity, natural gas, propane, et cetera, you're going to emit less carbon. So pretty simple there. Uh, and what's nice about that is that's the cheapest way to stop using energy. It's it's cheaper than just changing how you generate fuels. So that's why some people say energy efficiency is a conservation first. Like always start with this before uh, you make any sort of uh, changes to how you're using energy. And this has actually been recognized by the International Energy Agency. Their net zero scenario includes tripling the current rate of energy efficiency improvements across the world to achieve net zero. So it's really been recognized there as an important contributor. I'd also say using less energy also makes energy more affordable and helps to reduce uh, energy bills and makes buildings more comfortable. So there's some really immediate benefits to uh, individual energy users of helping them use less energy. The other piece though, that we talk a little bit less about, but I I think is equally or maybe even more important is reducing the demand for energy uh, during peak consumption periods. 
So the way most uh, electricity systems are designed, they use a mix of different generated technologies. So nuclear, coal, uh, hydro, um, solar, and the the energy systems um, are designed to meet the peak demand. So they're when they're people, the utilities are designing the systems. They're not saying, okay, what's the total energy that's going to be used? They're saying on that hottest day in July or that coldest day in February, do we have the capacity to deliver the the um, energy that's needed by energy users? And so if you reduce the uh, demand for electricity or, or demand for fuels at peak times, um, on the electricity side, you tend to reduce the higher emission uh, use of the higher emission generation technology. So for example, in Ontario, uh, natural gas generation is used for peak. So if you use less electricity during peak times, you reduce the use of natural gas um, for, for generation. But the other piece of it too, is that if you're looking at transitioning from one type of fuel to another type of fuel, as we're looking at for the energy transition, you really reduce the cost of the infrastructure if you look at um, making sure your your system works really efficiently and you, you're, you're lessening those peak demand periods. So it ends up just reducing costs a lot. So I think that's also a very important part, um, both in how um, you know electrific electrification is gonna be a big part of the energy transition, making sure that we're using energy efficiently will help reduce the costs of that, as well as any infrastructure that we may be using less of in the future. So yeah, and I, I spent most of my career, so particularly at the energy regulator, really looking at programs that are offered by utility companies, which are called demand side management programs, which aim to address usually both of those pieces. Well, why would a, a utility company who sells energy, why would they want to help their customers reduce their energy use? Uh, so that's a great question. And, and the answer is utility companies don't actually make money based on how much energy they sell. They make money on energy infrastructure. So we're talking power plants, pipelines, wires, uh, smart meters, uh, and utility regulators are the ones who make the decisions about what a utility um, may build. And the reason the utility regulators do that, like the Ontario Energy Board, is these companies are monopolies. They have customers that don't have a choice between what utility company to use. And so the regulators are in charge of deciding what the prices will be by making decisions on what infrastructure is invested in and ultimately what customers pay for and how it's allocated between different customers. Demand side management programs have been around uh, longer, than, longer than I've been working. And um, they were really set up for the reason I explained earlier, it's really to save money on infrastructure, but that was really about expanding energy systems at the time. And so it was helping customers reduce their demand for energy and then making it uh, reduce the amount of infrastructure needed going forward. But it was really looking at growth of all systems. And the idea was that this was an alternative to just building supply to meet the demand. It was also managing the demand. So just like energy infrastructure, demand side management programs are paid for by energy customers through their rates. So when you talk about demand side management programs and who they're paid for, um, I just joined the federal government. We talk a lot about taxpayers paying for things. This is about rate payers paying for things. They tend to be the same people. Pay, 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 energy customers tend to be taxpayers, but um, the, the money actually goes through utility bills as opposed to uh, taxation. So over the years, the aim of demand side management programs changed to focus more on saving customers energy. So that first uh, option I talked about. And I think the reason there was that it was a really big win for customers that they could uh, use less energy and you know get help with that more efficient version of their furnace or air conditioner. Um, but in recent years, there's been a refocus on reducing infrastructure costs again. Um, and it's, and as I mentioned before, it's both for systems that might be expanding, but also systems that we might be using less. In both cases, we want to use the equipment that we do have uh, effectively. We don't want it to, to stop being used suddenly when it hasn't been completely paid for already. 
So it's all about using assets efficiently. Well, that is cool. Well, here's an interesting question that I'm going to throw at you. If we were planning for the future in a perfect world with a clean slate, what systems or, or upgrades would be needed? And where would we start? Where would one begin? So I guess I, something that an idea that was um, introduced to me when I was studying uh, studying my master's program when I was in Europe was the idea of energy services. Uh, a lot of times when we plan systems, we're like, how much electricity does this new subdivision need? Rather than like, what services it needs. Humans don't actually use electricity directly. Our devices use uh, electricity. So um, we might want to look at uh, certain things like heating. Okay, this subdivision needs heating. What's the most efficient way? And you know, looking at economic, social, environmental factors to meet that need for this subdivision, and and balance it out with the other needs that are going to be uh, that are going to be needed. So the idea is, do you look at what the what you need at the end of the day, rather than they need this much electricity, they need this, this much natural gas. So I think that more holistic planning to say. Okay, here's what end users are ultimately going to need. What's the best system to deliver that would be great because the way systems are planned right now, it's much more siloed. That's much more electricity, gas. Um, so I think that that would be kind of my number one thing. The other thing, and this is something I think um, that I mentioned earlier that that I think can be done, um, that, that there's progress in, in working towards, is considering both supply side and demand side options side by side. And actually, this is so. So, my former employer, the Ontario Energy Board, released two policies related to this in 2021 uh, one on the gas side and one on the electricity side. And I'm happy to share those links, Brian, um, where uh, you have on the natural gas side looking at uh, a, a framework to compare supply side and demand side options. And the same thing on the electricity side, um, both with the goal of, of really um, using energy efficiency and, and helping to manage demand so that our energy systems are efficient as possible. Definitely. We'll do share those links. So it'd be great to have them. We can put them at the at the end of uh, of this podcast and, and, okay. and also on the links to the YouTube channel as well. How have things been made easier for people, places, and things to decarbonize? Uh, for example, uh, you know, to decrease the amount of fossil fuels that are burned to fuel their energy use. Sure. So uh, in over the last few years, there's been a really big focus at an up energy efficiency, helping um, to to enable uh, emissions reductions. And so maybe I'll start by talking about some of the programs that are offered uh, by the Office of Energy Efficiency. Uh, so one that uh, folks uh, across Canada will be familiar with are the Greener Homes Grant. So that offers five, up to $5,000 for retrofits uh, like home insulation, windows, doors, heat pumps, solar panels, and some resiliency measures as well. And it includes a pre and post uh, retrofit evaluation uh, according to a standard called Energuide, um, and there, there's support for that, uh, that grant as well. In addition, there's the Greener Homes Loan, which is offered not by the Office of Energy Efficiency, by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, that offers interest-free financing to complete uh, other major retrofits for the home, and it can be combined with this grant. So that's one that, uh, on, on the residential side, that's uh, pretty key. Something that was announced at the end of last year is the Oil to Heat Pump Affordability Program, and it covers uh, another $5,000 for purchase and installation of cold climate air source heat pumps. and. Uh, and, and the focus of that is really, as, as the name suggests, to move away from oil uh, specifically. And right now, uh, customers are eligible to pre-register for that program. It is specifically aimed at low to medium income homeowners. So that's kind of on the residential side. Uh, for uh, some other uh, supports that are being offered to provinces, territories, municipalities, the Codes Acceleration Fund is a, a support to really help accelerate the adoption of the highest feasible energy performance tiers of the building code and um, and to move towards net zero, as well as promote higher rates of compliance with adopted codes. 
and build capacity and support the market preparedness. And right now, there's currently a call for proposals. Uh, there's also the Deep Retrofit Acceleration Fund, which is helping to facilitate projects that um, really do those deep retrofits. And what we mean by deep retrofits are uh, those, you know, getting in, doing the insulation, not just those superficial measures, but things that you you are expensive to to get in there and change. But once you've done it, you reap benefits for a long, long time. Uh, the last one that I'll mention is, uh, in terms of programs, is the Green Industrial Facilities and Manufacturing Program. So this is for the industrial company, and uh, uh, sorry, it, this is for industrial companies, and uh, it supports uh, in industrial companies to do different energy efficiency initiatives, uh, as well as have more support from energy management advisors. And so that's also open for calls. So what's really exciting about this in my mind is there's supports across the economy for different types of energy users to uh, help save more energy, which will benefit them personally, as well as support emissions reductions. Uh, there is one policy I did want to mention on the federal side as well, and that's the Canada Green Building Strategy, which is currently under development. Its goal is to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, uh, get to 30% emission reductions by 2030, and that's in comparison to 2005 levels. And it's looking specifically at three pieces. So building net and climate resilient buildings from the start. So new construction, let's just build them right the first time. Uh, accelerating deep and climate resilient building retrofits and transform space and water heating uh, in particular. So that's actually expected to launch in the spring or summer of this year. So watch for that. It's going to be pretty exciting. And um, in terms of a policy that will really guide uh, movement towards net zero over the next years. Definitely <clears throat> have to keep an eye out for that one. I'm going to skip ahead because I know that, you know, provincial, provincially, there are a lot of programs yep. that are available to, to businesses and to individuals and residents. So, but I want to ask, do you have any tips uh, for figuring out which programs, you know, that someone's eligible in their province or city? So how would you recommend Are there are certain websites that people can go to? Yeah, I have a couple websites to recommend. There are a lot of different uh, options out there, and it's it's really good news. There's a lot of um, different uh, funding streams that you can access. I I, I do have a, a link that I'll share from Enercan that shows the different um, you put in your location and type of customer, and they'll give you uh, federal, provincial, and municipal programs that you're eligible for. I also have one that specifically looks uh, across uh, across the different organizations um, within the government of Canada. So really happy to share those. And so I suggest checking those out because there may be programs that you're not necessarily aware of that might be a really good fit for what you're trying to do. It seems that there's an opportunity to coordinate these programs more closely. And do you have any examples of really great uh, collaboration that has taken place? Yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about the idea of collaborating between uh, levels of government. I think it's a really big win for people who participate in these programs because you get access to different streams of money and benefits from different programs all through one window. Uh, I also think it's a really efficient way for governments and utilities to work together to achieve diverse objectives through a single program. And that's, I think that's a win for taxpayers and ratepayers because we're being more cost efficient. So a few examples, uh, Greener Homes has a number of partnerships uh, throughout the country, specifically, uh, I'll call out Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Quebec, where the uh, a provincial entity is uh, delivering greener homes. And so customers apply to, to provincial entity and get access to the, both the provincial and federal funding and benefits. Uh, the Another one that I noticed was the Mi'kmaq Home Energy Efficiency Project by Efficiency, that's delivered by Efficiency Nova Scotia. And I noticed that it was funded by the Government of Canada, the province of Nova Scotia, as well as through Nova Scotia Power. So kind of a three-way collaboration. So that I, I thought was really great. And uh, I also noticed Alberta's energy savings 
for business program, which leverages both provincial funds as well as funding from the Low Carbon Economy Fund, which is a federal a federal fund offered by Environment and Climate Change Canada. So this is, a, I hope to see more of this going forward. I think that um, it's a really good and efficient way to achieve savings as well as get benefits for energy consumers across Canada. In the past three years, you know, since COVID, I guess we could all say, and um, how has the energy sector changed? And what do you love about energy efficiency these days? What's, you know, the personal side and the societal benefits? A lot has happened in the last three years. So what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, I've seen a huge increase in the interest in the energy transition. And uh, so I mentioned new programs by the Office of Energy Efficiency that have been put in. Um, but I've also seen other programs within the federal government. At the provincial level, there's also been a shift. So you're seeing provincial government and territorial governments and utilities, utility regulators and industry all talking more about the energy transition and what their role is in that. Uh, and particularly, how do we make this affordable, which has been a really increasing concern, especially over the last year. Uh, for me personally, I found this a really rewarding industry to be in, and the renewed interest and focus on decarbonization has made it uh, pretty exciting and, and um, just a renewed focus on what I think was always a good idea uh, in terms of, of being more energy efficient. I'm actually really inspired that there's so many people working on the problem in different ways based on their skills and interests. Uh, for example, Maria, like this podcast, um, you know, really appreciate getting getting the word out there. I think that's a really important part of it. So um, for me, it's exciting to see so much more alignment and lively discussion on a topic, the, the climate change, which is pretty scary and, and challenging, but I'm very inspired and, and optimistic given... Um, all the hard work that people are doing in their respective areas. So, so yeah, I think it's an exciting place to be, and and really appreciate your work too, Maria, on uh, on getting the word out. So, thank you so much for for having me. I appreciate uh, you joining me today. I love your energy and your enthusiasm, your experience, and most importantly, your knowledge. And uh, for 15 years in, I can't wait to see what the next 50 look like. Let's say. <laughs> So you, uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll, like we mentioned earlier, we'll add the links or anything that you referred to during this podcast. We will put them either um, on the YouTube channel or we'll put them on our on the Reimagine Energy website so people can reference. Thanks for awesome. your time, Valerie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Valerie for joining me today. What a dynamo, eh? The link she referred to uh, will be on our website, reimaginedenergy.com. This episode was sponsored by Smart Energy, Canada's clean energy technology event that's taking place in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Make sure you register. I'm Maria McGowan. Thanks for listening.